Welcome to uh, New York State Environmental Facilities Court Audit Committee meeting. And uh, I'd love to uh, hear a, a, just a roll call, make sure we have uh, the members here. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Corcoran. Francis, I can see you, but if you could just confirm. Uh, I'm here, right. President. Perfect. Uh, Mr. Markey. Here. And we can see we have the chairman with us as well, Mr. Kazansky. Sure. Thank you. So uh, this meeting, we get to hear from uh, our auditors from KPMG, uh, uh, Jeff Mab and Marty Dunbar. They're going to give us a walkthrough of what they are planning uh, for the audit for this year. And so take it away, gentlemen. And Mr. Chair, just before KPMG yep. jumps in, um, we do have some draft meeting minutes from our December meeting um, that the <laughs> audit committee was also provided if we could just get a motion yep. and then any discussions on those. Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. We're eager to get started. I love it. I'll, I'll make a motion. They're, they're fine. I have no changes. I second that. All right. All in favor? Yep. Aye. Okay. Great. Okay. They're approved. Okay. So, KPMG, we'd love to hear from you. All right. Perfect. Good. Good morning. Yes, we're still in the morning time. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, thank you for having Jeff and myself. We uh, we are uh, we thought this would be a good picture for you. Clean water. Um, the uh, as we'll talk about in a few minutes. The uh, uh, our single audit work this year uh, will be focused on the drinking water uh, grant. So we uh, we thought that this would be a, a, a nice uh, picture to, to set the table. Um, so good morning, as I said to all. If if Jeff, you could go to yeah, there you go. Slide two. Uh, Jeff and I are excited for the 2021 audit, partially because um, hopefully, knock on wood, we're turning the corner. Um, and from a COVID perspective, as you recall, and the first item here on our executive summary is logistics. Thinking back to last year, we commenced the audit anticipating we would be virtual, maybe uh, on site, not ultimately knowing what would it ultimately happen at this juncture last year. Uh, and and we all know uh, quite well what's happened over the last year. So we were remote all the way through. This year, the plan is to be remote again. Uh, we uh, haven't stepped foot um, uh, on a client site for an audit engagement um, from from Atlantic to Pacific uh, in the last uh, in the last year, which is really incredible if you think about it, considering what we do as auditors for the many 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 years that we've been doing this um so um but that was uh that was accomplished through a number of tools and we're using one of them right now whether it's webex teams or, or one of the other platforms and, and that's what we, we used last year and, and we've continued to invest in that a bit which we'll touch on in, in just a few minutes uh, but more broadly speaking overall the plan that we put here is si substantially similar uh, with with our audit plan uh, last year, we'll highlight some of the the changes, but there really aren't too too many uh, significant changes. Which, when you think about a set of financial statements in an audit, that's uh, sometimes a good thing. Um, so so logistically, as I said, we'll be um, we'll be remote. We um, and and we'll continue to make sure we use our tools to uh, to help uh, make this as efficient as possible. Uh, we don't expect any issues from that perspective. Uh, again, our number one goal is a high quality audit. Uh, from a single audit scope perspective, uh, as I mentioned, this year we'll, uh, we anticipate the drinking water program to be a major program. Uh, um, and part of that, based on some of the expense um, uh, dynamics this year, uh, historically, there were more capitalization dollars that were um, that would have that were are spent, uh, and that might not necessarily be the case when we when we go through the, the the details of the expense. So, so the different compliance areas that are in focus might be a little bit different than they have in the past, and we'll get into that in a, in a little bit as well. Uh, and as you see, other matters there there are no other significant changes though 
uh, from from an from an audit approach perspective. And as always, um, we we encourage you to uh, feel free to visit our audit committee institute website if you guys are looking for information and what's what's happening uh, outside of the four walls of, of your business or outside of the four walls of, of new york state and beyond so we turn the page um, client service team perspective overall uh, that the purple boxes are intended to uh, identify those who are consistent faces versus those who are new and, and really there's only one new person our our in charge senior who will be leading the uh, the work um uh, nick otherwise jeff myself our specialists and uh and our uh, uh minority and women-owned enterprise uh firms that we uh subcontract with as part of our uh audit engagement with you are also the same as last year so uh, that should also, as you can imagine, contribute to um, a high degree of uh, not only efficiency, uh, but also, um, you know, effectiveness uh, of an audit that reduces the learning curve, which is which is important uh, when, when it comes to auditing. Um, and a little bit of a public service announcement, break us from the normal boring audit plan. Um, we as a firm have been on a bit of a journey now for a number of years and and that really like many businesses is uh reinvigorating the tools that we use really trying to stay a step ahead in this you know this data driven age that we're in and, and so a few specific things that we're presently doing uh that and you'll you in management more so will see over over the next uh, several years um are the 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 continued development of the tools that we're using so one example is we're, we'll be rolling out a new uh cloud-based um audit um, um application uh for for our audits on a on a global basis all industries the public companies the sec registrants implemented it uh as of december 31 2020 uh businesses and organizations including um, EFC will be in the um, a, a year from now uh, but in, in anticipation of that there's a few tools that we'll be rolling out this year um, the KPMG for client uh, management tool that will really help um, you know from a project management perspective and uh, you know exchanging data uh, we'll be rolling out that tool in addition to that We've been training our uh, teams, our auditors, uh, in uh, data analysis using tools like Altrix uh, and other data mining tools that we can use as part of our, um, our audits. So we'll, we're going to look for opportunities to use that as part of this year's audit. Um, it's still fairly new, but if it's not part of this year's audit, we would expect that to be part of the 2022 audit. Um, and um, and, and finally, the, the overall goal, as you can see here, is to enhance the audit quality and ultimately, uh, therefore, make the, the client experience, the experience from, from management and your perspectives uh, better. So, so we're excited about all the things that we're investing in, both of our, in terms of our people and our tools uh, and, um, and, and insights that, uh, that we might be driving through, through our uh, auditing. Next page. So back to the boring element, uh, the the usual piece of our uh, annual audit. So we're going to go through the the major areas of audit focus over the next uh, few slides and, and some of the required communications as well. So the first thing is we do at the outset of our audit is the risk assessment uh, phase. Where are the areas that are going to drive the greatest likelihood of a material misstatement to the financial statements or other risks, um, and in particular. Uh, auditing standards does require us to identify as a significant risk um, the risk that management will override internal controls uh, and uh, in some way uh, affect either the organization's compliance or uh, impact uh, what's reported in the financial statements. So we, as we have in the past, design procedures to address that, to address that risk. And as you can see under the our response um uh, uh you know title there there's a series of of bullets um that that summarize the procedures that we incorporate into our audit to address this this risk 
Uh, and so when we reconvene at the end of the audit, we'll, we'll walk you through uh, the results of our procedures with respect to the uh, management override, fraud, uh, and things of that nature. Continuing along with our audit focus areas, um, I won't go through our, our detailed audit procedures here. Again, when we reconvene, we'll go through uh, the results of the procedures that you see here. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say, over on the, on the um, uh, left-hand side of your screen, you see the financial statement areas. This really does encompass substantially all the financial statement line items or, or categories of transactions. So we ultimately have a, a pretty substantial level of coverage of the financial statement so that it gives us the comfort to uh, render the audit opinion on the financial statements. Cash uh, and investments, uh, that also incorporates um, our examination report with respect to New York State investment guidelines. Uh, so there's a, there's a unique uh, series of uh, steps that we execute with respect to cash and investments. And then certainly bonds on the receivable side as well as the payable side is really um, you know the 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 more the most significant accounts in the in the financial statement. So there's a there's a great deal of procedures we perform uh, over those areas to get comfortable with what's reported. Um, and then pension and other post employment benefits uh, represents an, an estimate um, uh, in the financial statements. And so we uh, we do take a, a good close look at that and do involve our actuaries to uh, help us. Uh, evaluate whether or not the models, assumptions, and what's included in the financial statements is appropriate in accordance with um, uh, uh, government auditing, or gov excuse me, government accounting standards, GASB. And heading over to page seven, um, grant income and expenditures uh, rounds out the, the sort of the income statement activity uh, of, of um, uh, EFC. And then we round it out with going through financial reporting, making sure that disclosures are appropriate, any new accounting standards have been adopted properly, um, and uh, that ultimately what's disclosed is, uh, is uh, complete and accurate, as I said. So, so a, a full um, um, uh, covering the, the financial statements from, from, from wing to wing. From a contingency perspective, that's the um, kind of goes along with every area. Uh, so it's so contingency, you think of, you know, potential risks or exposures uh, or, or liabilities that need to be recorded. When we're going through all of our areas, we're, we're contemplating that. Um, and, and certainly when we're going through minutes uh, or, or any other legal correspondence uh, as part of our odd procedures and other inquiries, of course, of management for other matters that are outstanding, um, that's what we're thinking about to make sure that there are any incremental accruals or adjustments to assets that are on the books are, are appropriately contemplated for financial reporting purposes. And so in a lot of ways, the contingency uh, item here relates to all the, the financial statement line items uh, and um, in audit areas. On slide seven here is, um, is a summary of our single audit. Uh, so an important element of our uh, audit annually is testing the compliance uh, with the federal laws and regulations, uh, those federal dollars that are spent, <clears throat> excuse me, primarily through the uh, drinking water and clean water uh, programs. As I mentioned at the top, this year, the drinking water uh, program will be in scope. It hasn't been audited in two years. And under federal regulations, you need to be auditing major programs at least every three years. And so this year, it's in scope. Uh, and, and what we, in you know, our planning discussions with, with, with uh, management is identified that there might be a, a bit of a change as it relates to um, dollars that were spent, uh, the capital dollars that were spent. And so there might be a greater concentration of less dollars spent and therefore uh, the administrative costs of the program, which are ordinarily uh, fairly immaterial, will now become a bit more material. So it might change some of the areas that we look at as part of our compliance audit, which is completely normal, um, you know, having done uh, a number of these single audits for, for many years at various organizations, uh, looking at different things from year to year is, is, is fairly common. And then one other thing that we don't highlight here on this page is in terms of overall coverage 
of the federal um, uh, dollars spent, the minimum coverage air, uh, amount from an audit perspective is 20% of your, of your federal uh, awards. And what we'll have to make sure is that the drinking water program achieves that level. If it doesn't, then we'll have to make sure that we'll also include the clean water program as uh, similar to last year uh, as part of this year's audit. So we'll, we'll, we'll certainly circle back to uh, the committee uh, upon completing the audit, uh, whether or not we have one or the two programs in, in place uh, this year. Um, the, uh, and again, the focus of the, of the audit, as I said, is to look at the compliance with these programs. And then in addition to that, it's also looking at internal control over compliance for these programs. Uh, so it's kind of a kind of a uh, two sets of reports that are really issued as it relates to um, the uh, the single audit or the uniform guidance audit. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then finally, uh, involvement of others. Uh, Jeff and I can't take credit for all the uh, all the work. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, so in addition to our our team, we do involve our tax folks to help us make sure that there aren't any. Um, um, issues with respect to, uh, you know, the exemption from, from a, a tax perspective, which usually is a, a slam dunk, of course. Um, actuarial specialists do participate in, the, uh, in, our, in our audit, as I mentioned earlier, with respect to pension and other post-employment benefits. And then we do utilize our national office and other related resources as it relates to the uniform guidance audit interpretations, latest guidance in terms of the regulations. There's been a lot of changes over the last year, certainly with the um, with 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 the pandemic, um, there's there, you know, a number of uh, federal programs have had some minor tweaking to accommodate uh, the unusual circumstances as it relates to control environment, remote working, and, and and things of that nature. So we do rely upon our national folks to help us uh, stay informed uh, from that perspective and, and consult with them as part of our procedures. Uh, so those are the primary folks that do participate as part of our procedures. Um, we do also use our, our center of um, excellence over um, uh, from an investment uh, pricing uh, perspective. And, and, and so there might be some others that do participate in our audit as well. And then finally, new accounting standards. There is GASB 88 this year that is effective. Uh, the title of it is certain disclosures related to debt, including direct borrowings and direct placements. Really what this, uh, as it kind of summarizes on this slide, what this standard really is, is just, it's not so much adding new debt to your, uh, your books, it's not changing that, but it's in, in um, enhancing the disclosures, the required disclosures, as it relates to certain uh, debt that you have outstanding. Based on our past experience and looking at um, uh, this standard, we wouldn't expect any significant new disclosures that are necessary for EFC. So this should be a fairly quiet new standard um, and we don't expect uh, too much to come of it because you already have uh, substantially all the necessary required disclosures as it relates to your debt. So this should be, uh, this should not be much of a, a, an accounting event, so to speak. This last uh, page here summarizes uh, the other elements of our uh, required communications at this point. This is planning, the planning phase. So there's really not a lot to communicate. It's more or less, what are we, we scoping to do? What's the, what's the nature of the project, the timing, uh, the logistical aspects? That's really what we communicate at this point. And then when we return back at the end of the audit, of course, as you're used to, that's when we report our findings uh, and uh, ultimately the opinion that we'll be uh, rendering on, on the financial statements. And so that the balance of our presentation really is more so for, for your um, your private consumption, but as, as you get to that point, you'll see that there's slides on uh, our continuing independence as your auditors and us staying on top of that. Um, responsibilities as it relates to the financial statements, just as a reminder, management is responsible for preparing the financial statements and having internal controls in place. We as the auditors are responsible for auditing it independently. You as an audit committee are responsible for oversight of the financial reporting process, the audit, uh, as you're uh, as you're currently um, um, doing right now as a, as a committee meeting with us and speaking with us. Uh, from an inquiry perspective, there are inquiries that we as the auditors need to make sure that we're making with you. Uh, the uh, the normal course of that is 
Uh, I do connect with Charlie at the uh, at completion of the audit, and we do have uh, a dialogue where we can I can uh, make certain inquiries um, uh, as necessary under the standard, so that there's a continued dialogue between uh, us as the auditors and you as the committee, and we uh, in turn report that as part of our um, uh, our audit report uh, at the end. So those are really the um, the appendix items uh, that are included here nothing too different from from the past i'll pause there that uh to see if there's any questions that i can i can answer or uh anything of that nature before we um yield the floor back to you thank you marty thank you. yeah anybody have any questions for marty i've got a couple little ones i just have a quick one um marty Moving information back and forth from a cybersecurity standpoint, you share information back and forth through a portal? Yeah, yes. Um, I, um, I probably will not do this adequate justice uh, in describing the technical aspects of it, um, but our, um, our, our platform uh, has a um, um, it's it's it is a, a secure portal in which um, your management team will uh, visit uh, our our um, site that is secured within the four walls uh, of of um, our our firm. That data that is provided to us is. Uh, limited to the information that we also retain in our work papers as well. So also, I guess, just as a reminder, so as part of an audit, there's a lot of supporting data that and information that's shared with us that we retain in our audit work papers. And so really, in effect, what our um, our portal is doing is is putting it there and, and we're uh, putting it into our um, into our audit work papers. And so as part of that process, we have our IT people um you know regularly uh do their risk assess uh, assessment cyber um and and uh evaluation uh and uh, and have um you know reports that um that we're allowed to share with our clients to explain uh the level of um security that we have over the data that we um that we receive as part of an audit Thank you. I'm just interested in the uh, drinking water grant uh, program that you're looking at closely. Uh, two questions, that 20% uh, threshold you talked about, I'm interested, who's th is that a KPMG threshold uh, or is that some, somewhere else where you said if it's not up to that level, you'd have to go beyond. Uh, and then the uh, other question is, do you directly engage with DOH, you know, when it comes to these drinking water grants? So first question, the 20% is, uh, is established by the Fed, uh, sort of the federal regulations. Um, the way that it works is if you're a high risk audit T, uh, that means you've had material weaknesses or instances of material noncompliance in the past, um then you um, have to have a 40 you you have to audit up to a 40 percent level if you uh don't have uh, instances of non-compliance uh material non-compliance i should say or qualified opinion um then 20 percent is the required coverage and so that is measuring so the so the schedule that is provided to the federal government is called a cfa the schedule of expenditures of federal awards um and that uh that that total amount let's just say for argument's sake is 200 million dollars what we as the auditors need to do in this case is cover 20 percent of that so 20 percent of 200 million would be 40 million dollars so the grants that we identify that are in scope have to add up to 40 million dollars or more uh in this in that example of coverage uh, to meet the uh, to meet the requirement um, uh, for for um, rendering the opinion on the from a single audit perspective, as it relates to the Department of Health 
substantially all of the information and uh, what we're testing really is solely related to EFC and does not um, overlap with the Department of Health um, because that tends to be more the, the sort of state expenditures. Now there is a piece uh, as that, that does relate to um, federal funds that relate to, um, to the Department of Health, but that usually is a pretty small dollar amount. Sure. Uh, and it doesn't fall into the scope of, of our procedures. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you uh, for, for this, uh, uh, you know, this plan. Appreciate uh, letting us know what, you know, again, not just what you're looking at, but what we should look at as well. And uh, just very helpful. Thanks for the, thanks for coming in and presentation. If our, yep. our pleasure. And certainly if there's any questions that come up, um along the way or anything along those lines you're uh welcome to uh to to contact us and uh, certainly if there's anything that comes up uh from an audit perspective we'll we'll be in touch with you thank you Martin. yep thank you so much uh if there's no other business i would call for a motion to adjourn i'll make that motion to second We are. Hi, Charlie. we are adjourned. Great. Thank you. And everyone, just so that you know, we have a slightly uh, new technical system. We're not going to be pausing broadcasting between the audit committee and the board meeting. Um, just wanted to make everyone aware of that before any, yeah, in case there was any personal chit chat. And it actually, uh, Chairman Svanka, it looks to me like we likely have everyone that we need. I just want to thank um, KPMG and I want to confirm uh, Roger, can you hear me and see me? And can you be heard? Yes, I can see everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. Fantastic. And Jim, can you hear us, see us and be heard? Absolutely. I hope you can hear me as well. Absolutely. That looks like we have, every, let me just make sure I didn't lose anyone in the interim. Kate, okay, can you hold for two minutes, please? Absolutely. All right. Just so that everyone knows procedurally, I'll just reiterate for any new attendees, um, if you're not speaking, if you could please mute your microphone, that helps us to cut back on any feedback. Um, and Jim, you probably picked up on this last time, but it's your, your first time in action. So when items are introduced um, and we take the motions, they're open for discussion, questions, the presenters are always up to discuss the items if need be. Didn't want you to you couldn't participate. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kate. I appreciate it. So, so you probably picked up on that last time that directors are absolutely free to discuss and review. Um, and also just procedurally, Heather's team um, put together a little visual for our um, direct financings and grants. So I'll be asking when it, we get there, just so that you know you'll have a visual to see where the actual projects are, and I'll be doing a little intro, very brief, um, just as that gets pulled up. Something a little new to keep you, keep you on your toes. Thank you, Kate. Absolutely. All right. Mr. Chair, if you're ready, we can proceed. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Kate. How about we start with the roll? Absolutely. Chairman Stefanko. Here. Mr. Sokol. Uh, here. Mr. Leary. Here. Thank you. Mr. Corcoran. <laughs> Mr. Marquis. Present. And last but never least, Mr. Krasansky. Here. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have the entire board present and the quorum is established. Great. Thank you, Kate. Welcome, everyone. All right. Let's start off with um, 
A motion for the approval of the draft minutes from the March 11 board meeting. I can make that motion, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Roger. How about a second? A second. Thanks, Charlie. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Unanimous approval of the minutes. Um, I have nothing special to report other than that it's pretty beautiful out. So hopefully we're uh, taking advantage of that. Um, Joe, do you have anything to report? Joe, you're muted. Thank you, Jeff. Um, good day, all. My report today is about progress. Uh, but first, I want to inform the board that we are obviously analyzing the impact of both the state budget and President Biden's uh, Build Back Better proposal. We're looking at it for the potential impacts to our operation and the operation of our partners. Fittingly, for our EFC 2021 efforts, as we need to be prepared for our responsibilities that will come out of both um, and get us ready to carry out our mission at a higher level of functionality than where we are right now, based on the resources we are anticipating uh, that we'll be responsible for. So progress. Uh, we're making progress, I think, every day. Uh, change is hard. Unfortunately, the obstacles of working in these challenging times have made it more difficult and prevented the team and I from getting to know each other uh, well. So um, it makes making our changes and evolution even tougher. So on the 14th next week, we'll be conducting the EFC 2021 town hall virtually uh, for all staff. I believe it's important to ensure that everyone understands how we'll work together to lead EFC in accomplishing our goals, meeting the expectations of the stakeholders and what my expectations are for them as, as a team. I want to discuss the game plan directly with the whole team and hopefully bring some transparency maybe where there hasn't been much in the past. So I'm looking forward to it and I hope the team is as well. Progress. Um, we're making slow and steady progress in addressing our technology issues, which clearly are one of the areas of our greatest need and candidly liabilities. Arguably, we are two generations behind where we must be. We have engaged the technology and operational leadership at ITS. I'd like to thank the Chief Information Officer for the state, Tony Riddick, Chief Technology Officer Rajiv Rao, and the Chief Portfolio Officer Jen Lorenz for the time that they're committing to this. We thank them, we appreciate their time, and together we've developed an action plan initially of what I'll call low-hanging fruit to find obvious efficiencies, start saving some money, and limit some risk. Strategically, we're taking a deep dive into our current systems, reviewing the previous effort and determining why it failed, and to position ourselves for a critical and I believe mandatory technology investment. Progress. Um, I'm looking forward a little later uh, in the meeting to presenting you with the resolutions, approving my appointments for our newest team members. And then finally, I'd like to turn it over to Heather to fill you in on some things we are trying related to the presentations to the board and for our stakeholders and the progress we're making on communications and engagement. So when Heather is done, be glad to take any specific questions, but outside of that, that's my report, Heather. Thanks, Joe. Uh, today, as we move forward into the board resolutions, you'll uh, see some new visuals we've added into our presentation to give you an idea of the scope of the projects that we have going on throughout the state. Um, those images will change each uh, month at our board meetings to give you a, a really good look at the broad scope of what we're doing. Um, additionally, we have been updating the website. We've made some changes that we will continue to do. We'll be changing photos on a regular basis, highlighting projects that um, you have all approved the funding for to show you what, what, what the work we're doing is resulting in. Um, we've repositioned information that's important to the front of the page. We've made it much easier to access uh, the board information, the board packets, and the board meeting um, uh, videotapes so people can find them easily. Um, we are now back on social media. 
And I hope everyone who is a social media follower will follow us um, on Twitter, on Instagram, um, and on Facebook. We also have a are posting our jobs on LinkedIn now. Um, we also back in uh, the press release arena. We've issued a press release uh, last week with regard to the uh, septic money being released. The second uh, round of that, and we will. The governor will be issuing a, a release after today's board meeting. Thank you, Heather. Mr. Chairman, that's uh, all we have, unless there are questions. Great. <clears throat> Anybody have anything? Okay. Uh, okay. We did have an uh, audit committee today. Um, and KPMG uh, did a presentation. Charlie, you want to add anything before we head into the resolutions? Yeah. KPMG was here. Marty Dunbar talked about the 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 plan for their audit. They've been with us for a number of years. Uh, they always they always do a thorough job, and really nothing significant that's new. Uh, and they've worked out the you know how to do this remotely from last year. And so uh, looking forward to hearing how that comes out uh, end of next month. Great, thanks, Charlie. Okay, um, unless anyone has any unfinished business, we'll move right into resolutions. Hey, resolution number one. Certainly, and just before I read the resolution into the record, I wanna give our IT team a chance to pull up the PowerPoint presentation that Heather was going over. All right, so if you can go to the next slide. That <clears throat> so as you can see, there's a, uh, our lovely state. And in green, you have the clean water financings that are the subject of your review and approval this meeting. And in blue are the drinking water. And all right. So without further delay, resolution number one, a resolution of the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation amending the prior authorizations for financial assistance to be provided by the corporation to certain recipients in connection with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. Okay. Could I have a motion, please? Mr. Chairman, I can make that motion. I'll, I'll second. second. Thank you. Audra. Thank you. Um, I'm so sorry. I don't have a visual for the board members currently. Can you just confirm who made those motions for me? Uh, Kate, I, I made the initial, and this is Roger. Okay, and I thank you. Charlie. We'll say our names. Thank you. I apologize. <laughs> Okay, uh, in this resolution, we have two clean water financings. The first one before you on the screen here is for the city of Oneonta in Otsego County. They are working on their wastewater treatment plant upgrade. Um, this resolution has a funding increase and a modification of the project scope as described in the fact sheet that you have. We originally closed this in 2018, and as they've been working along, it became apparent they need additional work. Um, to be done as part of the project that will be accomplished through change orders, which will are leading to the cost increase there. The second project is for the village of Waterville. I'm going to flip to the next slide. There we go. Village of Waterville in Oneida County, working on wastewater system improvements. Um, this project uh, originally closed in 2018. Uh, at that time, the construction contracts were only estimates as, as they worked through. Um, they refined the budget and the actual construction costs are higher than the estimates. Um, we are currently dispersing on this. We've dispersed about 1.5 million. Um, and I just want to mention on this, they're now qualifying for additional grant um, due to those increased costs. So those are the two for ID number one. Great. Thanks, Audra. Uh, any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, I think that was unanimous. Uh, let's move on to resolution number two. A resolution of the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation making certain determinations and authorizing certain actions in connection with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. I'll make a motion. It's Charlie. 
Thank you, Charlie. Second, it's Francis. Thank you, Francis. Tim. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, yes Tim. Uh, fantastic. Okay, great. Okay, before the board today are uh, six projects, three short term and three long term, seeking just under $17.8 million worth of authorization uh, to uh, credit of Heather and, and her group. We now have pictures to give some perspective, which is great. Start off with the first project, Town of Alexandria in Jefferson County on the St. Lawrence River. Uh, there are a series of communities along Route 12 that are still on uh, septic. They're going to be installing low pressure sewer and sending it to a uh, local wastewater treatment plant in the town uh, that's jointly run with Orleans and Clayton. And this project will also be uh, serving a state park, uh, Key Waden State Park, to get them off, which actually borders the St. Lawrence. So this project will help protect the St. Lawrence River directly uh, for two point, just over $2.5 million. Go to the next one. Shimung County on the on the Shimung River. This uh, project, it's a very, it's a large treatment plant. So uh, just over 12 million gallons a day. Um, serves quite a bit of the county. The uh, DEC has a statewide effort to do UV disinfection, uh, which is why you're seeing this so frequently as we uh, as we bring projects to the board. Just over 2.9 million dollars worth of authorization. It's a long term. They've completed the project. Uh, to comply with this uh, initiative. And this is in the Susquehanna Basin. Uh, City of Glens Falls, which is a short-term project of Warren County, it's right on the Saratoga border, uh, with just over $1.4 million. City is, uh, it's a combined sewer system, so this community, every time it rains, there's raw sewage mixed with stormwater that has been getting into the Hudson River. So this They've been taking on chunks at a time. This phase, there's two pump stations that are contributing to CSO events that they're going to uh, implement projects to reduce the amount of flow that goes to the Henry Street pump station, build a new uh, force main that uh, will, will uh, prevent CSOs coming from that pump station and direct and re-divert flows from the Finch paper pump station uh, to an existing sewer that has capacity. Um, to prevent those, uh, like I said, those CSO discharges every time it rains. Next. Town of Rockland, which is on the, uh, it's on the Beaver Kill, which flows to the east branch of the Delaware River, which then forms the border with, uh, with New Jersey. Um, it's in Sullivan County, just over $1.4 million. It's an older plant. Uh, it's about 35 years old. They're going to be doing a HUD Works upgrade project to for screening and grit removal uh, for that for that system to meet those Delaware River Basin treatment standards. Village of South Corning, also on the Shimong River, so it's a good day for the Shimong. Uh, short-term project, two hundred thousand dollars of short-term interest refinancing. So UV disinfection, similar to what we talked about with uh, Shimong, except this one they're, they're doing it, Shimong was at the end, and they're also doing uh, plant rebuild work. Much of that work is being funded by CDBG money. And the last project uh, before the board in ID number two is Town of Walcott on Lake Ontario. There are four inland bays uh, in, in Wayne County that border uh, the Lake Ontario. Uh, the one that where this focus area is, the Port Bay, so just over $9 million project. They're going to be uh, connecting homes that are on existing septic via low pressure sewers, uh, pump station, and then transmitting that wastewater to the, to the Red Creek treatment plant, which has the capacity to, uh, to accept this flow with design um, for that very reason to, to bring these flows in and protect Port Bay and, and Lake Ontario. That completes the, uh, the six projects for this morning. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> Any uh, discussion questions for Tim? I have I really one. Like oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to comment um, on the Lake Ontario and getting the septic switched over. 
to sanitary sewer is uh, just so important for the Great Lakes Basin. Right, yeah, couldn't agree more, Beta. I was gonna just ask about the Alexandria, the Jefferson County. So I, a big grant from uh, Rural Development, I'm just wondering how that, how, how that relationship is. You know, um, if the personnel has changed, because I know it's a, that's a federal agency controls that. And just really just looking for how that's going. We haven't talked about it recently and that's important. Uh, it's an important piece. Absolutely, Charlie. Um, and for our strongest co-funding partner, uh, besides DEC, which, which does it with uh, WQIP, is U.S. Department of Agriculture's Office of Rural Development. They, they're the only other agency that we co-fund with that provides both loan and grant. Most other agencies just provide grant. So our relationship with them, as you mentioned, Charlie, is so critical. On this project, whenever there's co-funding, we work it out. We talk early, we have monthly co-funding meetings that RD is a part of, as along with DEC, DOH, Department of State, uh, that brings all the information together so that we don't step on each other's toes or eat each other's lunch. Because when it comes to, to RD, if, they, if we displace any of their funds, they don't get to redeploy them within New York State. They actually get displaced out of the state and they return back to Washington, D.C., which obviously we love to keep as many uh, federal infrastructure dollars in the state as we can. So that relationship is critical to ensuring that we continue to uh, eat away at that very large uh, wastewater treatment need that it remains in New York State. So, in the, so wherever there's an RD package that a community can qualify for, they tell us immediately, and then we try. We work with them uh, whenever we're considering them for other grants. That it doesn't result. Uh, it results in as good of a package as we can get to a community without displacing federal dollars. So, thank but, you. But the, thankfully, and thankfully. From a personnel standpoint, the people who are um, who we've been working with the last couple of years are there. So, from a continuity standpoint, um, we have a strong relationship. Um, Brenda Smith is the is the lead there, and um, <clears throat> if there were to be a change, that would be one of our early conversations with that uh, important co-funding organization, so that we bring whoever else, uh, whoever the next person is in up to speed, get them understanding where our strategies are. Uh, again, because our mission is, uh, as Joe has said several times, to the people of the state of New York. And we wanna make sure that we continue to do that as wisely as we can. Excellent, thanks. You bet. Thanks, Tim. Anything further? Okay, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, another unanimous. Um, resolution number three. A resolution of the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation authorizing financial assistance payments to certain municipalities to fund eligible clean water projects <clears throat> from funds appropriated for the New York State Water Infrastructure Improvement Act. Okay. Can I have a motion in a second, please? This is Vita Markey making the motion. Jim Leary, I'll second. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Fantastic. So it, I'm I'm going right. You are, Tim. It's all you, Tim. All right, I'm on. Fantastic. Okay, five projects before the board. Uh, getting a variety of WIA, right? You've got as WIA as old as 2015 and as new as 2019. Uh, the projects were presented in either ID number one for the village of Waterville or uh, ID number two uh, for Alexandria, Shimong, Glens Falls, and Wilcott, $5,421,551. Uh, we talked about Alexandria, how important it is to get those septic systems um, as well, uh, both in Port Bay and Wilcott and in Alexandria uh, to uh, proper wastewater treatment and disposal. This is a uh, $667,773 WIA grant. 
next. Shimon County, Shimon River, uh, they're going to be doing that uh, UV disinfection, or they've done their UV disinfection project to comply with DEC requirements, uh, $1,415,000 we had grant awarded from 2018. Let's Falls, we talked about the CSO project and how that's on the, continuing to be implemented in the city through something called a long-term control plan. Um, they received a WIA grant in 2019 for $468,425 for, to, to do that work at those pump stations, enforcement work in particular. Village of Waterville in Oneida, uh, Audra presented on this project. Um, the village is uh, doing a uh, wastewater treatment plant improvements, and uh, it's a full plant rebuild from an older plant. It discharges to Big Creek, which then flows to Oriskany uh, Creek, which then flows to the Mohawk River, $245,353.2017 uh, WIA grant. And the last project, I mentioned Town of Wolcott, Port Bay, septic uh, projects being taken out for uh, low pressure sewer and horse main conveyance. 2015, uh, when we awarded WIA at the time, this project was already um, in, a, in an agreement. So to save that community the cost of a, of a closing, uh, we delayed the award of the uh, WIA money until long term. So that saves them the, the additional fees associated with the closing. Uh, $2,600,000. $25,000 WIA grant. That completes the uh, presentation. Thanks, Tim. You bet. Uh, any discussion? Great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Resolution number four. Resolution number four, a resolution of the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation amending the prior authorization for financial assistance to be provided by the corporation to certain recipients in connection with the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. Thanks, Kate. Uh, can I have a motion and a second, please? This is Roger. I can make the initial motion. Thanks, Roger. Jim Leary, I can second. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Audra. Okay, we have one project in this ID number. It's a drinking water project and it is for the village of Tannersville in Greene County. They're upgrading their water treatment plant, groundwater source distribution and storage. Uh, they need a funding increase and an extension of the financing maturity date so they have time to wrap in all of the work. Uh, we originally closed this one in 2016, but it has been moving. We've uh, dispersed almost $3 million already, um, and we are currently dispersing with them. Uh, they have high bids. Uh, so bringing the total short-term interest refinancing to what you see there, and you will also see this project again in ID number six because they're qualifying um, for additional WIA grant. Thanks, Roger. Discussion? Um, Audra? Yes. What was the, what was the specific um, increase in cost was it the development of an additional groundwater source was it replacement of the aged water main was it rehabilitation of the tank or was it so so my understanding is um sorry so so my understanding is that you know when we closed this in 2016 the project was getting started and they had estimates so as they've been working along in 2016 they've been taking on each portion of the project and each portion has been coming in with high bids so now they are closing in on the final portion of the project and because there's been high bids all along they don't have quite enough money to finish that so i think it has been across most of the project you know, as we have been seeing with other projects as we've discussed, you know, previously. Thank you. Yeah. Anything further? Mm -hmm. Great. All those in favor? 
Aye. 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 Another unanimous. Resolution number five. A resolution of the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation making certain determinations and authorizing certain actions in connection with the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. I have a motion and a second, please. Vita, I'll Jim. make that motion. And Francis will second. Great. Thank you, Vita and Francis. Uh, Monica. Hi. Hopefully everyone can hear me. I have five projects that are listed under this Drinking Water State Revolving Fund financing. Uh, the first one you see up on your screen, the Village of Albion. That is a short-term market rate financing. This project will be funded with $1,299,600 in DWSRF short-term market rate financing along with the 2019 WIA grant for $1,949,400. Uh, project scope includes several upgrades to the village's water treatment plant. Um, these improvements include chemical feed equipment, ventilation upgrades, upgrades to the clarifier system, their finished water pumps, and also filtration piping. Project scope also includes repairs to their 16 inch diameter transmission main and upgrades to their booster pump station number one. The project rehabilitates a water treatment plant that is almost 60 years old, so definitely beyond its useful life. And also the transmission main repairs will ensure adequate water supply to this municipality. Construction is started and construction is expected to conclude at the end of next year. Next project. A short-term interest-free financing for the village of Andover, that's in Allegheny County. Project includes $3,571,000 in short-term interest-free financing, along with $3 million in DWSRF grant money. This project includes development of a new groundwater well to provide redundancy, and it replaces a well that has determined to be under direct influence of surface water, otherwise known as GWIDI. The new well will correct a surface water treatment rule violation. So very important. Project also includes replacement of aged water mains, some security upgrades, a new booster pump station, um, and new SCADA, which is a telemetry system so that they can monitor the system better. Uh, there's also new meters included as part of this project. Construction is expected to start in August of this year and is estimated to take two years to complete. Next project, Village of Stillwater. That's in Saratoga County, as shown on the map. This project will be funded with $488,946 in DWSRF short-term market rate financing, along with a 2019 WIA grant for $733,418. The project scope includes the replacement of approximately 4,900 linear feet of aged water main. The main that's being replaced is the service line coming from their water storage tank. And due to corrosion and tuberculation within this main, the pipe impacts the pipe's um, ability to supply water for drinking and also for fire flow coming from that water storage tank. Construction is expected to start next month and end in December of this year. Next project. Hmm. To the village of Westfield. That's in Chautauqua County. And this project's going to utilize $2,360,794 in long term interest free hardship financing. This will be paired with $1,852,800 in DWSRF grant, of which $25,234 is left to disperse. The project scope includes much needed improvements to the village's water treatment plant, such as roof improvements, new windows, adding backup power, replacement of the multimedia filters, and also repointing the brick facade of that water treatment plant building. The project also includes some water main replacement and upgrades to an existing booster pump station. The scope is going to address deficiencies cited during the village's last sanitary survey by the New York State Department of Health. Construction was completed for all four construction contracts associated with this project back in 2019. 
So this, again, just so I, I probably should have said before, but we've moved on. This is long-term financing associated with DWSRF. And the last project, if you want to switch, is going to be for the town of Wyndham. That's in Greene County. This is also long-term interest-free hardship financing. That's going to total $5,066,000. Uh, $5, it's going to be paired with $1,700,000 in 2015 WIA grant funding. And that WIA grant will only be applied to phase two of this project. The project's scope includes a new backwash tank and backup generator at the West Winds Water Treatment Plant. The project also includes installation of approximately 10,500 linear feet of water main to replace aged mains. And also part of that aged main that's being uh, replaced is going to connect the Hotel Vienna, which is a private water system that currently has very poor quality water. So we're going to bring that and interconnect that into this system. It's also going to interconnect two water systems that used to be completely separate. So now together, now that they're connected, they'll be able to serve as source redundancy for each other. Construction started in 2016 for this project with an additional contract recently executed in 2017. The final contract was executed in 2019. And that final contract just completed in fall of 2020, which is why now they're going for long-term closing. That completes all of the projects that are listed here under DWSRF ID number five. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, any discussion or questions for Monica? <clears throat> Monica. Hi, Vita. I have a question on Andover. Yep. That one I in Allegheny County? I love the way you said Gweedy. Oh, you That's like great. that? I it's groundwater under direct influence, and we definitely, it raises our concern as soon as we realize it's influenced by surface water. Oh, I'm familiar with it. I'm familiar with it. So my question is, um, in that first paragraph, it says, if well development is not successful, then a new water filtration plant. Correct. The greedy spring. Yeah. How is that reflected in the cost? Is if this, then that? I mean. No, nope, it's included. It's in it's included. So, so they've they've plan on addressing that. However, it goes, you know, and ideally, I think it could impact maybe what the uh, municipality brings to the table for their portion of funding. But it, it's going to be. Um, they've made the promise to us that it will definitely be addressed. So if if new source then shows that it's also gritty, then they'll all move on to treatment of that gritty. So if there, so this isn't on your radar potentially as a um, a cost increase because they switched their methodologies. Um, they're saying that they've worked it. So I think they made estimates for both, and then they've covered it by a worst case scenario. So they've promised us within these money amounts that they can do either. Thank you. You're welcome, Monica. This is Joe. Can I follow up on that? Yes. You said that they promised us. Well, that's how what they've they, committed to. The engineer is committed to that. How did they commit to it? Is it uh, in the writing? In their money amounts. So, yeah, in their application, they have stated that they will treat if it's quitting. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, anything further? Excellent. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Unanimous. Resolution number six. A resolution of the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation authorizing financial assistance payments to certain municipalities to fund eligible drinking water projects from funds appropriated for the New York State Water Infrastructure Improvement Act. Uh, can I have a motion and a second, please? I'll make a motion, Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. Jim, you a second? Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Me and Vita, it was close. Uh, okay, I think it's uh, Monica again, please. It is. I'll be happy to go over ID number six with you. All of these are Water Infrastructure Improvement Act WIA funded uh, projects, some of them along with other funding sources. You can see on the ID number six page, there's eight of these. 
Four of them are going to be repetitive. We've previously spoken about them. Uh, the very first one, Village of Albion, we previously discussed because of their short-term market rate financing. Um, Village of Naples, we have not discussed that yet. That's Ontario County. Total project cost to be funded with $1,152,000 in 2019 WIA grant. It's going to be, be paired with a rural development loan of $1,417,000. The project scope will replace two transmission mains. One's 65 years old and the other is 85 years old. So they definitely got their money's worth out of those. But they are now antiquated and beyond their useful life and they threaten their water supply. So they're going to be replacing those two transmission mains. The project will also replace approximately 12,500 linear feet of eight inch water main to improve pipe flow and overall water quality. Construction started in August of 2020 and should be completed this summer. Second project on our list, the city of North Tonawanda. As shown, that's in Niagara County. Project is to be funded with $1,836,907 in 2019 WIA grant. The remaining cost of $1,224,605 will be covered by municipal contribution. The project scope includes electrical <clears throat> excuse me, electrical power upgrades, including a standby generator, a transfer switch system, variable frequency drives, and associated upgrades at the water treatment plant. This project improves the resiliency of the water treatment plant and ensures safe drinking water can be supplied at all times. Construction started in the summer of 2019 and should end in October of this year. The fourth one on our list, that's the one in the village of Stillwater. We previously, uh, that's in Saratoga County, we previously discussed this project when we discussed their short-term market rate DWSRF financing of $488,946. Now we'll be talking about their 2019 WIA grant funding of $733,418. So, if not... You know, we discussed that one, so I don't have a project description for it, but I can go back if anyone has any questions on it. Um, number five on this list is the village of Tannersville. That's also one that we previously discussed when we talked about, um, Audra talked about their amendment. And that one includes $2,281,903 in short-term interest-free hardship. DWSRF financing, and that's going to be paired with $74,799 in 2015 WIA grant, along with the time extension of one year that Audra previously spoke about. Number six on this list is the town of Ulster in Ulster County. Project will be covered with $457,200 in 2019 WIA grant, and that's going to be paired with $300. $304,800 in municipal contribution. This project will replace a water storage tank that is over 40 years old. Completion of this project will increase the water storage to support demand that's expected from the pending service to a New York State Thruway Authority rest area. Construction is proposed to begin in August of this year and will conclude in November of this year. Number seven on this list, we have not discussed yet. That's the Water Authority of Western Nassau County. It is in Nassau County, as shown on the map on your screen. Project to be funded with 2019 Emerging Contaminant Grant of $1,930,200 and a 2019 WIA grant of $3 million, that $3 million and $1,930,200 is what totals that $4,390,200 that's shown on your screen. So total grant funding is that $4,930,000 and it's going to be paired with $3,000,000 $286,800 in municipal contribution. This project includes the design and construction of new treatment to remove uh, perfluorooctonic acid, PFOA, and perfluorooctane sulfonic acid, PFOF, from four existing wells. The scope includes new granular activated carbon, GAC filtration, along with new well pumps, 
piping to accommodate new treatment buildings and new SCADA controls. That supervisory control and data acquisition allows them to remotely keep track of things. Completion brings this water system into compliance with the recently adopted maximum contaminant level MCL regulations. Construction started in December of 2019 and should conclude in June of this year. And the final project, that uh, project in the town of Wyndham, we previously discussed this when we spoke about their long-term interest-free hardship financing. It's going to be paired with 1700000 in 2015. We a grant, as we previously discussed, that will be applied to phase two only. So if anyone has any questions about those eight projects that were included as part of ID number six, I'd be happy to try to answer them. I have one, Monica. Okay, Charlie. Specific to North Tonawanda, it's um, I'm interested. Again, I don't expect you to have this now. Maybe just uh, you know, send send it. Just anybody is interested. I'm interested in a breakdown of of that. Just really focused on how much of that three million dollars total goes for replacing this diesel generator. I know there's an, a lot of uh, electrical system upgrades. I guess I'm just interested in what that money uh, goes for, because it's all for the electrical system and uh, for the generator and then uh, the size of the plant. Just give me an idea of what that uh, of what that work um, at a plant that size uh, costs. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I can follow up and I'll get you that information, Charlie. Great. Thanks. Vita, did you have something? Yes, yeah, so I have a question on um, NASA County. First of all, you did a great job pronunciating the PSOA. Very good. Um, and I know that this is, we're kicking off that, I don't know, what was it, 61 or so different locations for this. But my question is, do any of the costs include any future O&A of replacing the granular activated carbon in the cost? Does it at least include one round of it? Um, how is that being factored into the cost? Um, so we don't fund uh, what we consider O&M. We don't cover those costs because they can vary and I think it's just we don't we don't allow them to include that. So this would not include that. Um, that's something that they would have to work into however they charge for the water or bill for the water. They would have to work those costs into that cost. Are you seeing anything reflected in that cost that's going to address the long-term train of treating activated carbon or do we have any guide? maybe it's more from DEC's end what's going to happen with the activated carbon is it going to be recycled you know because we're creating this train by installing yep. these systems you're correct and so um you know that varies by municipality how they plan, you know, to handle their GEC in the future, whether they, you know, decide to reactivate on site, whether they have it trucked away and replaced, that varies. And so, um, you know, I'm sure the municipality is aware of that maintenance. Everyone that, you know, implements GAC becomes quickly aware of that requirement and, and how it's unique to their system. Um, I can try to follow up with you if you'd like and get more information on what this particular system plans to do if you want. But, Tim? Look at you, raise your hand. You're so polite. <laughs> um, yes, I'm trying to do my mother proud. Um, Vita, uh, this goes for both the clean and the drinking water programs. O&M is specifically precluded in the legislation. We cannot fund ongoing operation and maintenance. We can't fund salaries. We can't at, at, the, at the treatment systems. These communities are supposed to have user charge systems in place to ensure that they have sufficient revenues the replacement of, of the uh, activated filter. However, during construction, whether it be a treatment plant at a, for a wastewater system or for drinking water, the initial uh, carbon that gets uh, provided as part of the project is considered a capital expense. So that so when they start it off, you you can you know right it does it can't operate unless you have that that uh, granulated activated carbon installed. <laughs> But then the ongoing uh, efforts to recharge it, as Monica was saying, or replace it, has to be built into the user charge system. 
And we don't have any responsibility to ensure that it is as we're installing these new systems at all of these new locations. Well, I, I guess that right there, there is in our PSA and I'm looking at our, our council. Do we, do we have council on the call? I'm not sure I'd see anybody. But as part of our PFAs, we have an ongoing, uh, there is an ongoing op uh, ex expectation that these, that they maintain these facilities in good working order during the full repayment of the loan. Mm -hmm. Now we rely on the wastewater side, we rely on DEC to ensure as part of their oversight of the, the NIPTES per program. And then on the drinking water side, thankfully DOH uh, has oversight and they either do it directly or through their county health departments. Thank you, Tim and Monica. Monica? Yes. Whatever you uh, prepare and send to Charlie, can you please share with the rest of the board members and the offices? I sure can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anything further? Further. <clears throat> Great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> None opposed. Resolution number. Excuse me for that phone call. We're on number seven. seven. A resolution of the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation authorizing the president of the corporation to take necessary actions with respect to the administration of the engineering planning grant program. You can have a motion in a second, please. I can make the initial motion as Roger. I think and I saw second. Jim's hand up as well. Thank you, Roger and Jim. Tim. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. All right. So here we are again, annual uh, request to the board to continue the op the uh, operation and funding for the engineering planning grant program. Certainly one of my favorites, and I know it's something that the board uh, typically asks about and is happy to hear um, whenever a project that is initially funded through the engineering planning grant program results in a um, in a financing. Uh, just to give you a little history, uh, we've been running the program since 2012. There have been 463 awards for $17.7 million. And of those uh, projects, so those awards then result in uh, communities being able to hire engineers, which then result in engineer reports. And sometimes when you get a $30,000 grant and you find out you got an $8 million problem to solve, it doesn't always, you know, make you jump out there and, and want to run out and take an SRF loan. So there is some time, but it feeds the pipeline, the beginning of that pipeline that we need uh, to, um, to help communities begin to address their, their water quality problems. And it's going to help us because the Clean Water Needs Survey is coming up. Uh, that's going to begin in January of 2020, hasn't been done in January 2022. It hasn't happened in 10 years. Getting all these engineering reports developed helps the state uh, defend its 11.1% allocation. But from those uh, four, 463 awards, we've had 276. Some of them are completed. Some of them are still uh, being developed at this point. 276 projects were ended up on the IUP. We've done 123 financings for $693 million. And I didn't mention it as part of the uh, my presentation in ID number two, but four of those six projects that we presented today were engineering planning grant uh, projects. So, you know, we're planting the seeds, it's, it's springtime, right? It's all good, it's beautiful outside, and we're growing SRF projects with this uh, EPG program. Uh, so this year, we're uh, so we're currently out with a an ask for engineer report applications, engineer plan grant applications. The board authorized that last year before the pandemic kicked in. There was a delay in the implementation. We actually went out with the program in December. We took applications through the middle of February. We're scoring those projects and we expect to make an announcement uh, later this spring. But we're on the heels of, uh, now that the state budget is completed on the heels of starting up the next round, and that's what this resolution is uh, today.
Thanks, Tim. Questions, discussion. I'm just such a fan of this as well, Tim. I love it when we see them on the, the, the write-ups that they've been queued up by this. It's, it's a great program. Um, Madam Secretary, maybe check the one, two, three, four, the fifth whereas in the resolution. Uh, there's just a, a typo in the <clears throat> word clean water, just a FYI. Just caught my eye. Thank you. Thanks, Vita. We will fix that up before it's finalized then. Thank you for thank you for letting me know. Jeff, if I might. Sure. Uh, I think this is a great program. Um, I think the team's done a wonderful job. It's been a great collaboration with our uh, with our friends at DEC. Um, I'm committed to it. Uh, I'm committing to finding uh, more resources for it, finding out ways to leverage other dollars so we could do more of this. Uh, and I'm, uh, I, I've directed staff to take greater accountability uh, for the program um, uh, here at EFC um, and treat it as, uh, as our baby, if you will. So uh, I, I'm very uh, proud to be part of it. And uh, I think it's an example of, uh, of a good public policy. So just a, a, a well done to the team on it. I hardly agree. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. <clears throat> uh, resolution number eight. A resolution of the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation authorizing the president of the corporation to take necessary actions with respect to the administration of the Green Innovation Grant Program. I have a motion and a second, please. I'll make a motion. This is Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. I'll second Nita. Nita and Jim, thank you. Ryan. Sorry, I just lost my connection briefly. But um, this is Brian Hahn, manager of the Green Innovation Grant Program. Um, to echo some of the same uh, schedule as Tim with the EPG program, we currently have a round out right now. Um, and just to, I think numbers speak for themselves a little bit about the Green Innovation Grant Program in that it is still popular. Um, this current round, there's over 130 applications submitted for over $145 million dollars which we're offering 17 million. So the the need is there. Um, we brought the board to a few of the projects in the past few years uh, so they could see with their own eyes some of the great work that the communities around us do through this funding. And uh, just for some of the newcomers, the Green Innovation Grant Program provides grants on a competitive basis for water quality and climate mitigation pro, uh, projects. Uh, they are capital projects, unlike the EPG program, where that's more of the planning grant side. But um, we expanded in the last round to include, in addition from the green stormwater infrastructure projects, um, energy efficiency and water efficiency. And it looks like we've got some uh, good interest in those categories as well. Thanks, Brian. Discussion. Great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous again. Uh, resolution number nine. A resolution of the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation approving the appointment of Chief Operations Officer and Senior Vice President of the Corporation. Can I have a second, or a motion and a second, please? Jim Leary, I'll motion. Thanks, Jim. This is Roger, I can second. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Joe. Joe, we can't hear you. Thank you, sorry. I'm seeking your approval today of the appointment of Molly Larkin to serve as our Chief Operations Officer and Senior Vice President. Molly will lead the new Division of Operations and Program Management. The division will now be responsible for all of EFC's programs engineering, project management, technical assistance, and capacity building. 
Molly will be joining us after serving most recently as Deputy Commissioner for Design and Construction at the New York State Office of General Services, the first woman to serve in that position in the agency's 60-year history. Under Molly's charge as an OGS executive, Design and Construction performed professional design and construction contract administration and management for over 30 state agency clients and managed over a billion dollars in active construction projects annually doing this out of 50 field offices in every region of New York State. Throughout her eight years as a member of the OGS senior staff, Molly has led a reorganization modernization of an antiquated design and construction unit, instituting a new management structure, a new approach while introducing business tools to the public works operation, including full site life cycle of capital projects from design, contracting, procurement, contract disputes, claims through construction execution. Molly's leadership in New York State extends well past your traditional responsibilities at OGS. Having been called upon to join the teams that have worked on most of the statewide emergencies and responses in the last eight years, particularly notable during this last year when she was actively engaged in helping to fix the New York State uninsurance, uh, unemployment insurance program when the system was overwhelmed and hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers were hurting. She also helped steward testing and vaccination operations for statewide COVID-19 pandemic response. Undoubtedly, and hopefully many of you have seen the fruits of her labor uh, in this arena. Prior to joining state service, Molly worked in the private sector for Gilbane Building Company, a major national construction firm. She earned the BS in civil engineering from Union College and an MBA from Union Graduate School, which is now Clarkson University. Molly is a change agent, committed to serving her fellow New Yorkers, and is one of the strongest leaders and teammates I've ever had the pleasure to work with in government. I believe we are fortunate that she will contribute all those attributes to EFC to help lead us into the future. And I ask for your consideration and disappointment. Thanks, Joe. Welcome aboard, Molly. Great to have you here. Any other uh, questions or comments? Great. I would just sorry. I sorry. Just quickly, I'd like to Go say ahead, hi, I'm Molly Larkin. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everyone, distinguished members of the board, and uh, fellow EFC, DEC, and DOH um, teammates. I couldn't be more excited to be a part of EFC 2021 with everything that Joe has been going over. I thoroughly enjoy people. I thoroughly enjoy process. Both of those clearly lead to partnerships and performance. So. The, like Joe said, the life cycle, I'm very interested in the life cycle of a project. I think Tim explained it really, really well here, you know, from the start of a planning grant all the way through the fruition, the faster we get these projects done, the and and the execution of the the those projects, the benefits of the community everyone's going to have. So it's in all of our vested interest to get these done, know the status of them, build that capacity and the scalability as we are going to get a huge influx with everything that's happening this year. And I, I couldn't be more excited. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah, well said. Welcome. Great. Welcome. Okay. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Great. Uh, next item, resolution number 10. And I did want to just note for the transcript, those who aren't saying it looks like we may have lost uh, Director Corcoran. We still have a quorum of the board. Shouldn't be any issue. I've sent an email to him, haven't heard back, but I did want to just note for that record. Um, all Thanks, right. Kate. Sorry about that. So, number That's 10. All right. A resolution of the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation approving the appointment of secretary to the corporation and senior policy advisor. Okay, hey, can I have a motion and a second, please? I'll make a motion, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. I'll second, Vita. Thank you, Vita. Joe again. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm further pleased today. Uh, we talked a lot about progress in my report, but today I'm especially pleased because of Molly and because of uh, um, my presentation of my next appointment of Thomas Baines as secretary to the board and senior policy advisor. In addition to the critical responsibilities of secretary to the board, Thomas will serve in that role as senior policy advisor. Well, he will lead our policy and innovative innovation initiatives, will identify, monitor, and evaluate policy trends in government and related industries, 
He will initiate and formulate policy responses, develop information resources that are going to drive our strategic goals and undertake projects that explore and research policy issues and idea. And Charlie, rest assured, I put water meters on the top of Thomas's to-do list. Uh, prior to state service, Thomas held several leadership roles in government and the not-for-profit sector before accepting a prestigious Empire State Fellowship at OGS. Whether it was for community services for the developmentally disabled, as director of finance and control for the city of Buffalo's Urban Renewal Agency, or as executive director for the city of Batavia's Housing Authority, Thomas's strategic strengths and dedication to public service have been the hallmarks of his career and of his time as a fellow for New York State, where his work ethic and commitment to the mission and team moved the agency to offer him a permanent management appointment. However, the agency, however, Thomas believed and we supported that his public service career would benefit from earning a law degree and becoming an attorney. Thomas has graduated <laughs> from Albany Law this past December with his JD and is dutifully preparing for his bar examination, he promised me. Uh, he holds an MBA from uh, Madai College in Buffalo and a BA from SUNY Oneonta. His broad, relevant experience, strong leadership, and a commitment to the type of work we do on behalf of the people of New York, make him ideal to serve as secretary to the board and lead our policy and innovation efforts. But before I seek your consideration on the resolution, I wanna take a moment and thank Kate Howard. Kate stepped up, helped the team, and is doing and continues to do an extraordinary job as acting secretary to the board, and doing so especially during very challenging times your efforts, Kate, have been meaningful and we appreciate them. She will be working closely with Thomas during a transition period. I know she's excited to get back to her critical role in legal affairs. But Kate, on behalf of all, thank you kindly for your effort and your hard work. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's been an honor to help. I'm thrilled that I got to work with everyone and learn a, a different aspect, sort of more the 30,000 mile view in the different areas, but I am very excited to getting back to practicing law and working with Thomas to transition him into this fantastic role to work with all of you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kate. And members, again, for your consideration, uh, I advance the appointment of Thomas Baines. Great, great. Thank you, Joe. Yes, uh, second, thank you to Kate as well. Been super helpful to me as the designee to the chair um you'll be you'll be missed but hopefully we'll see your your face around uh in these meetings in the future thomas welcome as well can't wait to uh, work with you and if there's anything you ever need from me or dec please don't hesitate to ask hopefully uh we're getting you set up well out in, in western new york um yeah. If I could likewise, speak. if any other members would like to chime in, or Thomas, if you have anything you'd like to add. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, having me today. Um, just to echo what Molly said, you know, uh, respect to all the team members and your respective agencies. Um, I'm super excited to uh, come on board and be a part of this awesome team. Just uh, hearing some of the uh, projects that you have pending and ongoing. It reminds me of the work that uh, we did here in Buffalo at the <clears throat> Renewal Agency, funneling those funds through to the, the, the boots on the ground and the work done in the community. So that's really, really what I'm excited about. So, um, you know, bear with me as I go through this transition period. Again, thank you, Kate, uh, for your, you know, <clears throat> reaching out to me and all others who reached out. Um, I look forward to meeting you all um, and, and continuing the great work of EFC. So thank you. Welcome, Thomas, and thank you, Kate. I will echo that. Thank you <laughs> very much, Kate, and welcome, Thomas. I look forward to working with you. Okay. If there's nothing further, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you very much. All right, that concludes our resolutions. Um, I don't see any new business unless anyone has anything they'd like to share before we adjourn. Thank you, Jeff. No, we're good.
All right, I'll take a motion and a second to adjourn. Roger, I can make that motion. Second. See Roger and James, thank you very much. We are adjourned. Our next meeting will be Thursday, May 13, uh, 1130. And I hope everyone enjoys this nice start to spring. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks for the visuals. Yes, the visuals have been great. Thank well, you. Nice Thank you. Everyone have a wonderful day.